All right. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get in our Father's Word. Elihu, on he goes. He has, you know, he had to wait till last, but boy, he's making up for lost time there after his long wait. And he's still going to go on and on. It is obvious that um, if you weigh a man's w words well, you can almost read his mind. And we're, we're going to play that little game today with uh, Elihu to see where he's coming from. We know that he's pretty intelligent. By that I mean he's pretty familiar with God's Word because many of his statements are right on. But there's just one sad thing. Just enough of them to turn the whole thing around are wrong. So he's not nearly as full of wisdom as he presumably uh, considers himself. Let's see what we can learn about this individual today as he continues laying it on poor old Job. Chapter 34, verse 1, a word of wisdom from our Father, and verse 1 reads, Furthermore, Elihu answered and said, and he didn't stop there. He just, he just keeps going. He said, I'm, I am going to teach you wisdom. Beloved, it's always best you let God teach you wisdom from his word, this letter that he's written, verse 2. Hear my words, O ye wise men, and give ear unto me. You listen just to me. Ye that have knowledge. Now that's kind of a slam in a way. He's He's already told them basically that they're not wise and they, do, they don't have knowledge. So naturally he is um, bearing down on them. Verse 3, for the ear trieth words as the mouth testeth, tasteth the um, meat. In other words, as the mouth tastes good meat from bad meat, let your ears test good words from bad words. Now, and naturally, his thoughts are, you've heard a lot of bad words, now listen to my good words, okay? Uh, I guess that's human nature. Verse 4, let us choose to us judgment. Let us know among ourselves what is good. Uh, let's just take a close look at the facts. Well, now, that's a, a method of teaching that I adhere to or attempt to very closely because it is the facts that um, you must base your um, thoughts upon, and you get some bad facts, and you're going to have some bad thoughts. So, conclusions, I probably should say. So, nothing wrong with sticking to judgment. That means to look at the right facts. Verse 5, for Job hath said, now he's going to quote Job, I am righteous. And God hath taken away my judgment. In other words, um, God's taken away my right. That's what Job said. Verse 6, should I lie against my right? Question. My wound is incurable without transgressions. Though, though I haven't transgressed, I bear incurable wounds. I'm in bad shape. 7, what man is like Job? who drinketh up, scorning like water. With his, what he said here it really is, with his thirst for irre irreverent, um, reverent talk. He's slamming God. He's saying God isn't fair. Now, now, what would cause this young man to say that? He's no different than the other three. He's got to think that Job is a sinner and terrible that he brought this upon himself or he wouldn't have made that statement, period. It's obvious he is judging. He's brought judgment, all right, and it's Elihu's judgment, not God's. He's already made his mind up. Verse 8, which goeth in company uh, with the workers of iniquity. In other words, that kind of judgment goes with bad company. Job's been keeping bad company. Maybe the other three didn't like that. And walketh with wicked men. I'm sure this young man is making points with everyone, okay? Now, again, I must draw you back to reality if you have let it slip a notch or two. Back to chapter 2, verse 7. You know what company has been walking or following Job. It's Satan. 
and he's getting to him every time he can. And no one to this point, to this time, has blamed Satan. Always looking at man or um, at God in a sense. Verse 9, for he hath said, speaking of Job, it profiteth a man nothing that he should delight himself with God. Now, um, this man kind of stretches the truth again. Again, I want you to remember God didn't say that. Elihu did. All right? Um, it uh, doesn't profit one to find favor with God. Now, Job didn't exactly say that. And, you know, you can change a few words and a few points. Um, it, uh, this would be his interpretation of Job's word. And, and don't worry, I'm going to saw the floor out from under him here in a little bit to show you what I'm talking about. Ten. Therefore, hearken unto me, ye men of understanding. For be it, for be it from God that he should do wickedness, and from the Almighty that he should commit iniquity. Well, now that's an absolute fact. There's no one would argue with that statement. But just because, uh, always be on guard. Just because a man can rattle off a lot of proper, correct, biblical statements, that doesn't mean you should accept everything he says without checking it out. That, that's, a, that's a fantastic statement. 11, for the work of a man shall be, shall he render unto him and cause every man to find according to his ways. That's the same old words as the other three. In other words, Job, God judges a man and by what he does and renders the same back to him. Can't you see, Job, why you're in this shape? That's the same old words. The Job was innocent. And this man is convicting him, though he's going to be impartial and, and stick to facts. It's not so. To make a beautiful statement in verse 10, to be so accurate, and then to say a thing like that. Now that's human, that's mankind, all right. Verse 12. Yea, surely God will not do wickedly, neither will the Almighty pervert judgment. In other words, God means what he says, does what he says, and you can count on what he says. God's not going to change it. That, that's a true statement. But it, it uh, doesn't have any... It's, Thing to do with Job's case. Why? Because Satan's um, about to uh, tear him apart. 13. Who hath given him a charge over the earth? Who, who's given him a charge over the earth? Or who hath disposed the whole world? Who, who, who's doing that? Verse 14 will comment. If he set his heart or mind upon man, if he gather unto himself his spirit and his breath, but this is saying, if God chooses to withdraw the breath of life from man, man's dead. Man is nothing. And uh, who hath uh, given him a charge over the earth, or who hath disposed the whole world? Now that should cause you to stop and think for a moment. What, I want you to let your mind go back to the temptation of Christ in Matthew chapter 4, where Satan promised him, hey, I'll give you the whole world. Because God does let him have his way with the whole world. He's the prince of the air, so to speak. The prince of darkness. The prince of this world in its ways. And, you know, you would think they come so close to nailing the facts that should be considered. And then just let Satan go scot-free. And unfortunately... In many people's lives, they, the way they live, you would think that they thought Satan was a good buddy of theirs or something, and who knows, maybe he is. Um, so um, that should, as I stated, cause one um, to, if God withdraws the breath of life from man, he's nothing, so you better stick to the Father. Strange he would end that with such a good statement and then miss the whole uh, ballpark. Fifteen. All flesh shall perish together, and man shall turn again into dust. If God withdrew his breath of life from them, that's true, they would. 16. If now thou hast understanding, hear this, you listen to me. 
Hearken to the voice of my words. Uh, the word voice here would be better translated teaching. You listen to the teaching of my words. Boy, he's, 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 to be such a young man, he turned into an expert just right away, did he not? 17. Shall even he that hateth right govern? And wilt thou condemn him that is most high? You're going to condemn God? Of course, he's talking to Job. Let me ask you a question. You've been with me through these uh, 34 chapters. Have you, heard God con have you heard Job condemn God? I haven't. I heard him say that if, if, um, if it was intended that he should even work to the death in what he was doing, he would still trust God. That's what I heard Job say. You see, there have been many words, 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 and sooner or later you can forget, well, who was Job discussing at that time? You've got to rightly divide the word. I'm giving you that as a warning because we're going to trip up Elihu before this lecture is over. And that has a lot to do with it, rightly dividing the word. 18. Is it fit to say to a king, thou art wicked? Also to princes, ye are ungodly. Would, would you walk up to a king that had the powers to behead you and call him to you? Surely you are a worthless man. I don't think you would. I mean, that just wouldn't be too bright, would it? Where's Elihu going with this? You should know, 19. How much less to him that accepteth not the persons of princes, nor regardeth the the rich more than the poor, question, for they all are the work of his hands. Um, therefore, God doesn't really show any difference between rich and poor in his mind. But at the same time, we see here, um, um, Job was pretty well respected in the community, and it seemed that this young lad might have a carryover from that, a little jealousy or something. Something would put those thoughts in his mind, or maybe it was just listening to the friends, the three. Verse 20, In a moment shall they die, and the people shall be troubled at midnight and pass away, and the mighty shall be taken away, without hand, without the human hand. God just pulls the string on the old, uh, the cord of life, the silver thread, ere the silver thread should part. Now, God doesn't go around killing people. I want you to know that. It was just his natural order of things. So don't go preaching sermons. Well, it's true. God, if he wants you to pass away at midnight, you're gone. That's Elihu that said that, not God. If I were you, I wouldn't teach it. Verse 21, for his eyes are upon the ways of man, and he seeth all his goings. Uh, God does know. He, know. he can read your mind. He knows what you're doing. That's why he is able to judge man, because he knows what's in your heart. He knows what you're really thinking and what you really, your intentions are. Uh, that's why you'll always get a fair shake, meaning you're going to get what you deserve all at one time. Verse 22, there is no darkness nor shadow of death where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. There's no hiding from God. God knows everything. Verse 23, For he will not lay upon man more than right that he should enter into judgment with God. Uh, God has sets no, uh, he uh, sets no set time He's a lot, he's patient. He waits a long time. God will always give a man, what, what's called, why? It's one of his children. It would seem that that tenderness has left the minds of the three friends and this Elihu, but God is very tender. And um, God does know, and God's patient. As a matter of fact, we know that from the second uh, book of Peter, chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, where it says God is patient, and long-suffering is the word translated in the English, long-suffering, but that means patience, that all will come to repentance. Will they? No, of course not. 24, <clears throat> excuse me. He shall break in pieces mighty men without number, and set others 
in their stead. He sets them up, he takes them down. God is in control, in where, whereby it would have to do with his plan. Verse 25, therefore he knoweth their works, and he overturneth them in the night, so that they are destroyed, they're crushed. You know, I think he chooses a bad um, choice of words because Satan works at night, God works in the daytime, God works all the time, but usually uh, uh, the prince of darkness is Satan, and destroyer is one of his names. 26, he striketh them as wicked men in the open side of others. For their crimes, he always strikes them, he always brings them down. Now again, uh, I want you to remember who's talking, and he's, he's still talking to Job. He said, Job, your crimes will always bring you down to the place right where you are now. So you see, there's no different, again, I would repeat, than he, from this one, than the three others. Without documenting, as Job requested, show me one crime. Tell me when, where, and, and how I accomplished it. Show me the sin, document it. They haven't done it, but they're all ready to accuse him. This is, you have to hand it to this lad. He's doing it kind of coming through the back fence gate, but that's what he's doing. And the reason God is allowing this in this way, he wants you to be sharp in discerning men that profess to teach the sayings of God. Elihu sure does. <clears throat> Verse 27. Because they turned back from him and would not consider any of his ways. They just wouldn't listen to God. That, that's, a, that's a good statement. It's true. Many people won't, and that's why they get in trouble. 28. So that they caused the cry of the poor to come unto him, and he heareth the cry of the afflicted. God, God hears that cry. Well, now here he's kind of insinuated, Job, you've sure heard a lot of people. Why would he be saying that to Job? Yeah, it's a true statement, but it's the wrong set of facts for Job. 29, when he giveth quietness, who then can make trouble? And when he hideth his face, who then can behold him? Who can see him? Whether it be done against a nation or against a man only. And God does control nations as well as man. There is no nation in power except God has ordained it to bring about the fulfillment of his plan, basically overall. It may be for a negative purpose, it may be for a positive purpose. And God doesn't bother explaining why he does things. You've got to be pretty sharp and you've got to uh, have wisdom from God to understand why he does the nations and man as he does. Otherwise, you're going to be very confused. Verse 30, and, and that's a true statement. There's nothing wrong with that statement. Verse 30, that the hypocrite reign not, lest uh, or nor the people be ensnared. God kind of takes care of the people. He doesn't let them get trapped. Well, eh, 31. Surely it is meet to be said unto God, I have borne chastisement. I will not offend any more. Now that, that is, he, he lets the whole fox right out of the bag there or turns the fox loose in the chicken house. In other words, with all this having been said, Job, surely you should say, I have borne chastisement. God has punished me. I got sores all over me. I, I, I know God, I hear you. I will not offend anymore, God. I mean, he, again, he's talking to Job. You know that God was so proud of Job that he, he told Satan, he said, you can't, you can't have him. That's my servant. That's my boy. That's not what God wants from Job. God's wanting Job to stay tough, hang tough, son, hang tough. And then you get a, you get a, an idiot like this comes along. In other words, you can read his mind because you know what he thinks of Job. He thinks Job is a sinner in, in a max, to the max degree, 32. 
This is what you should say, Job. You might as well say to yourself, that which I see not, teach thou me. If I have done iniquity, I will do no more. Now, he's using psychology here. He didn't just come out and say, you have committed iniquity, Job. If I have, you would be smart to say, all right? And that which I see not, teach thou me. And, and he might as well say, and please teach me through this young man sitting right here, Elihu. All right, got it? Hold still, Job, as he stated in verse 33 of the last chapter. I shall teach thee wisdom. He's laying it on, isn't he? I hope you can see God wants you to know you cannot trust men with big words uh, of swelling wisdom that they claim to have. Stick to God's word. Verse 33, should it be according to thy mind? Job, you think it should be the way you think? He will recompense it, whether thou refuse or whether thou choose, and not I, therefore speak what thou knowest. You choose this way or that, Job, God's going to get you either way, right coming out the gate, you sinner, you. All right, he's laying it on him. 34, let men of understanding tell me and let a wise man hearken unto me. In other words, let men of understanding load my pistol and Job, you listen to me. Um, he was surrounded by wise nuts, all right. The three friends in this character, 35, Job has spoken without knowledge. Uh-oh, that's cuts. And his words were without wisdom. What a slam in the face. 36, my desire is that Job may be tried unto the end because of his answers for wicked men. I don't like what Job said about wicked men. Job being a wicked man, that makes him a hypocrite, all right? So you know now what he's talking about, 37. For he addeth rebellion unto his sin. He clappeth his hands among us and multiplieth his words against God. He is a rebel and a sinner to boot. Well, I'll tell you again, if you've got a friend like that, you sure don't need an enemy. Poor old Job, chapter 35, as he continues, let's go with it. Elihu spake moreover and said, when he got, I mean, he wound this duck up and turned him loose, old Elihu. Two, thinkest thou this to be right? Again, he's still talking to Job. That thou saidest, my righteousness is more than God's question. I hope I would not have to tell you. Uh, let, let me ask you a question. Did you hear Job say that? I sure didn't. I mean, this guy has lost his cotton pick in mine. Chapter, verse 3. For thou saidest, what advantage will it be unto thee, and what profit shall I have if I be cleansed from my sin. Now, Job said that. Did you hear what he said? Job did say that. But uh, I suppose this is probably one of the best pl places where we can say, let's learn to rightly divide God's word. Because any way you slice it, if some person comes up with you and you've got to give a yes or no answer, did Job say that? The answer's got to be yes. But that's not the facts. Job in chapter 21, verse 15, I'm going to turn there. You're not going to have it. It don't matter. 21, 15, you can listen to me. In 21, 15, Job said, and here it is coming from his own mouth, what is the Almighty that we should serve him and what profit should we have if we pray unto him? So Job said it. But um, what was Job talking about back in verse 7? Wherefore do the wicked like become old, yea, are mighty in power, their seed established. He was talking about the wicked and what they say. Job didn't say it. 
So when you rightly divide the word, yes, Job said it, but he was speaking and using this analogy or metaphor as to what wicked men say and teach. Job did not teach it. So Elihu, we can come to another conclusion. Is there, here come, we come to another why in the road in deciphering this man Elihu. We have to decide, he's not very smart. He was listening, that's obvious, for he quoted the statement correctly. But he wasn't listening too good because Job didn't make the statement in the first party, meaning coming from his mouth, but from, that this is what the wicked men say and their offspring. So we have to decide, Elihu is either just plain old stupid and doesn't listen well, but then, you know, he's not stupid. This cat, this character, he's quoting scripture pretty well, and he, hey, he's got it pretty well put together. So then what conclusion must we draw? He has to know that Job was speaking of what the wicked say. So therefore, he just branded himself as declaring Job as one of the wicked. You got that? Now, you can make your mind up other, either way. You can say the man is stupid, but you'd be pressed pretty hard because he's sharp. He's certainly intelligent. But it's very obvious in my mind, and I will choose that way, that he has already branded Job as wicked. Now, if someone's already branded you and they're trying to counsel you and find out what's wrong, you're fighting a losing battle, friend. I suppose the thing I want you to see is why God put so much into this book of Job, teaching you how that you must, I mean really must, rightly divide the Word of God. That means, that means pay attention to who's speaking, who they're speaking to. Was it God speaking? Was it Satan? Satan has words written in God's Word. Does that mean, because Satan's words are in the Bible, does that mean we should teach Satan? I think not. God gives his little creatures, his little children, um, enough leeway to say, I put a brain up in your head, can you use it? There are exceptions to every rule, but to common man, you can attain wisdom from God if you think. And you must learn to think for yourself. You cannot listen to Elihu. You cannot listen uh, even to Job as far as that's concerned without checking him out. Uh, I think we just put the, I think we just put the uh, big anchor on Elihu and we can just go ahead and throw him overboard and sink him because we know now he's no good. He's worthless. Got a good mind, quotes a lot of good scripture, but as far as holding the truth, he's a flop. He's a bigger flop than the other three were. I mean, he uses his intelligence to entrap Job by twisting sayings. That's of Satan. So now, inasmuch as um, Elihu means God is his, you might wonder, well, which God is he serving? Got it? Okay, let's go on. Verse 4. I will answer thee and thy companions with thee. He's getting pretty bold now. He, he's beginning to strut a little bit even. I want to talk to you, and I'm also going to include these three knuckleheads you've got with you over here. Job 5. Look unto the heavens and see. You consider. Look up at them. And behold the clouds which are higher than thou. Okay, got that. That means there's something higher than we are, all right? Six. If thou sinnest, what dost thou against him? And if thy transgressions are multiplied, what dost thou unto him? Question. What does that do to God? Seven. If thou be righteous, what givest thou him? Question. Or what receiveth he of thine hand? 
Verse 8, listen carefully. Thy wickedness may hurt a man as thou art, and thy righteousness may profit the son of man. You may hurt or you may help uh, uh, only man is kind of what he's saying here. We're going to get to prove him a liar again, aren't we? And you know why, don't you? I think God was counting on Job pretty heavy, if you ask me. I mean, he threw the whole, he threw the whole thing. And he didn't take any advantage for Job. He trusted Job that much. I mean, the game was on. And it's a game that continues from the garden to this day between Satan and God. God had a lot riding on Job, so I think whatever Job did meant a great deal to the Father. Verse 9, I'm just, just showing you how that you want to be very careful of Scripture when an idiot is the one that's talking. Verse 9, by reason of the multitude of oppressions, they make the oppressed to cry. They cry out by reason of the arm of the mighty. 10, but none saith, where is God my maker, who giveth songs in the night? It makes it so sweet. Verse 11, who teaches us more than the beast of the earth and maketh us wiser than the fowls of the air? He's getting poetic now. 12, there they cry, but uh, none giveth answer because of the pride of evil men. Poor baby. Verse 13. Surely God will not hear vanity, neither will the Almighty regard it. Now that's a slam at Job. You see, what he's saying here is, Job, do you know why God's not listening to you? You're vanity. That means you're nothing. You're empty. You're no good, Job. I, again, man, I mean, if you've got friends like this helping you, I feel sorry for you. I mean, but that poem, I, you know, that, well, that's a beautiful poem. It's not quite square, but we'll let it go at that. 14, although thou sayest thou shalt not see him, yet judgment is before him. Therefore, trust thou in him. My, 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 they sure let uh, this old boy Put faith first, all right? Job has already done that. He said, out of this whole deal, if I die, I still will trust God. I'm not about to take away my faith in him. So he's wasting his time with that statement. 15, but now, because it is not so, he hath visited in his anger, yet he knoweth it not in great extremity. His anger has not come and he has not recognized um, and God doesn't give credit or recognize stupidity. That's kind of a low blow at Job. I think he just called Job stupid. I'm afraid the shoe's on the other foot. 16 to complete. Therefore doth Job open his mouth in vain. There you got it. Nail it to the wall. It means empty. Job's full of empty words. He multiplies words without knowledge. Again, boy, if you've got a friend like that. Here Job is very wise. He was one of the chief elders of the city. And he was wise enough in God's word that God chose him of all men on earth at that time to stand his part. And then you've got some knucklehead like Elihu that comes along after listening to debate, ratchet jaw, ratchet jaw, and he didn't learn a thing, as wise as he is, because he falls right in, only he's really worse than the three. He's very bold in his criticism. You know, when you tell a man, you, you know what, uh, when, when you tell somebody that in their head all they've got is, van uh, is emptiness, do you realize what he called him? Uh, you know, they say somebody that's empty-headed doesn't have a brain. That could, I would consider that rather insulting. Rightly dividing the word. You know, there are people that will actually go along with what this character is saying and 
teach and believe that God really was correcting Job here and that Job had done all these things? Why? Repetition. It's just like gossip. If it's repeated often enough, you're going to have a, I would say the majority that are going to believe it. Boy, you can take a little old town and let a little bit of false word just get spread around and pretty soon it's, it, it makes headlines. Gossip, gossip, gossip. Nobody ever checks facts. Nobody ever discerns. Because, well, how could the majority be wrong? Friend, that is so easy because the majority has been wrong since the beginning. It's only a minority that have the real truth and care to search for it. Job's a real good book. It's kind of repetition, yes, for a purpose to teach you how to rightly divide the word whereby repetition does not put, allow you to, um, to your mind to slip off course, regardless of how much repetition, how long and vain the sayings are, that you stay on the true course and look at the true facts rather than garbage. Garbage in, garbage out. A lot of people get garbage in and they keep it. See that you don't. You do that by rightly dividing the word of the living God. You should apply these things to your own life. You have probably been given one of the greatest psychology lessons by our Heavenly Father that you're going, to, as you're going to find in the word of God in the book of Job. Teaching you how to understand men how that, what you can expect from men, and how that you must discipline yourself. If there's any one thing you should learn from this book, it's that you must discipline yourself to stay focused. Because the least little moment you allow yourself to go to sleep and willy-wally just a little bit, you're going to be on the wrong road. You've got to keep your eye on the truth. Discipline yourself to that. That's the lesson. Use it in your daily life, and you'll be a lot more successful. Otherwise, I'm sorry, there's people going to take advantage of you. You'll be an easy mark. Why? No discernment. Great lesson in this book. Don't miss the rest of it. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The strong.